to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Welcome to this special. One is a household name, a folk hero. The other was sidelined even just a couple of decades after she participated in India's first war of independence, the revolt of 1857. I'm talking about Rani Lakshmi Bai and Begum Hazrat Mehal from Awadh. Uh, joining us today is a uh, historian and the Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University, Dr. Rudrang Shu Mukherjee, who's done seminal work on the revolt of 1857. His latest book, A Begum and a Rani, delves into the lives of these two very, very fascinating women. Also joining us uh, today is uh, the senior bureaucrat and uh, history buff, uh, uh, Mr. Wajahad Habibullah, who joins us from Lucknow. Mr. Habibullah is part of uh, Live History India's advisory board and someone who has uh, made it a lifelong mission to understand the nuances of history. So I'm really, really happy to have him join me in questioning Dr. Mukherjee. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Mukherjee, let me start off with you. You know, when I was looking at this book, I was wondering why it took you so long to do this book <laughs> because these women are such fascinating characters in their own uh, uh, and uh, even though we know, we think we know so much about Rani Lakshmi Bai, actually we don't know that much because uh, as I was going through uh, a lot of the correspondence that you have cited, the details of how the revolt kind of panned out, you realize that there is so, so many facets to this uh, very interesting uh, woman that we don't know about. Hazrat Mehal, as you rightly said, uh, has been completely relegated. So uh, after six books, you're, you're looking at these two very interesting women. What took you so long and what stood out for you when you were researching this book? I came to it, as you say, slowly. That, but there is a logic to the process. Uh, my principal interest initially, and still not initially, on the revolt of 1857 is to see it as a kind of a manifestation of popular resistance to British rule in the 19th century, a culmination of a process, localized prote uh, protests and resistance to British rule, which then in 1857-58 engulfed practically the entire Gangetic Plain and North India. So as a, that was my principal interest. So naturally that drew me to our, which according to all accounts was uh, the principal theater of popular resistance in 1857. So my first book is on Awad. Uh, Awad in Revolt, 1857-58, A Study of Popular Resistance. I think the title gives it away, uh, the geography as well as the line of argument. So that was my initial interest. I looked at Awad and in that book, I must confess now, looking back, Begum Hazrat Mal is there, but she, she is not the focus. She's very much there. Uh, then I was looking at other aspects of popular resistance, particularly how the rebels used violence. Uh, that led to my second book, Spectre of Violence, hitting the massacres of Kanpur. Now, as I was looking at this, I realized that I hadn't studied as I was doing these works. I hadn't looked at another very popular theater of uh, another very theater of popular resistance that Jhansi. Mm. Okay. And so I decided to look at Jhansi. The original idea was that I would do a book on the rebellion in Jhansi. Uh, but then as I was looking at the material on Jhansi, this contrast became very stark that here you have a rather reluctant rebel who becomes a national icon. And, and you have Begum Hazrat Mahal who joins the rebellion in our practically from the day it started and now is on the margins of uh, oblivion. So I thought this would be a good way to look, contrast these two or look at these two 
the trajectory of these two women together in one book. So yeah, I've come late to it, uh, but I hope I bring a more mature perspective than I would have if I had uh, jumped in when I was in my 20s, when I wrote my first book. Undoubtedly you have, but before I get Mr. Habibullah in, I have to ask you this question, Dr. Mukherjee. You know, uh, you rightly say that a lot of our understanding of the revolt of 1857 was because of, or, or, or uh, attributed to the British uh, writing on it, you know, because uh, most of the rebels were so illiterate, they didn't really leave records. What are the challenges for a historian when you're looking at this kind of body of work? Because over the last four decades, you've done such a lot of interesting work from local sources, from you know peasant movements, etc. What are the challenges that you faced? So the first challenge, of course, is we are looking at the archives, what I call the archives of the victors. So to sift the bias, um, you know, the phrase that was coined, I think, uh, by Ranajit Hua was how to read the prose of counterinsurgents. So you read the prose against its grain. The grain is to glorify. If you read it with the grain, you are actually looking at a prose that glorifies British triumph, British endurance, British military tactics. But in the process of doing that, because they're trying to glorify their own achievements, they're also telling you what kind of resistance they actually encountered. So that allows you a perspective into what the rebels were doing. So if you sift that bias aside, that triumph and glory, it's pomp and glory, uh, if you sift that aside and just look at what they were telling you about the rebels, how many of them were there, where they were located, what kind of arms they were using, it's, you know, so then you get to get a you get a picture of the nature of the resistance, the nature of the popular participation, and it's. I want to make this point because I don't think this point is made sufficiently. Uh, a few years ago, and very justifiably, uh, there was a lot of talk with William Dalrymple's book on uh, Badusha that there's a lot of Persian material. Urdu and Farsi material that exists, at least so far Delhi is concerned. Now, as Dalrymple's book showed, having looked at that archive uh, through a translator, uh, as that, that archive doesn't really alter our understanding of 1857 in any major way. It enriches in terms of detail. But what uh, historians who have been looking at the revolt of 1857 from the, pro, from the rebel perspective, what they have written so far uh, is borne out by what uh, Dalrymple unearthed from those Parsi and Urdu records. Mm -hmm. But as I said, we were enriched in detail as well. So it's not as if the archives of the victors cannot tell us anything about what the rebels were doing in 1857-58. It's a very rich archive, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done in those archives for various different theaters. I think, for example, uh, there's a book to be written about Kumar Singh in Jagdishpur in Bihar. Uh, only one book exists on him, and that book was written in the 1950s. So we need to look at the records regarding the uprising in Jagdishpur. Kumar Singh was a remarkable figure. He actually marched in those days from Jagdishpur via the top of what is today Madhya Pradesh, the, and then came to Lucknow and fought in hours against Colin Campbell's troops. So it's a, it's a historic march about which we need to find out more details and why he took, undertook this march. I have some guesses and speculations about it, but uh, uh, I need to look at the records if, again, I go back to 1857. Right, and that's probably your next book, <laughs> Dr. Mukherjee. But no, I don't, uh, no, I don't think so. I think I'll give 1857 a bit of a rest. No, please don't. <laughs> please don't, because, because I do think that this also underlines another facet, which is that 
Lucknow becomes the epicenter of all the rallying rebe rebels. And Once Delhi falls in September, October, Lucknow is the center, not the epicenter. The next 10, the next 10, uh, 10 months. Uh, Mr. Habibullah, let me get in, get you in here. In fact, Mr. Habibullah will today join me as a co-anchor <laughs> questioning uh, Dr. Mukherjee because he loved the book so much. And really, uh, Mr. Mr. Habibullah, this is a seminal work on uh, Begum Hazrat Mahal because I haven't come across a work on Hazrat Mahal like we were discussing before. And that is why this book is so important. But tell me, what amazes me is why there is such little, you know, public discourse or analysis or or uh, the so kind kind of folk uh, hero worship of Begum Hazrat Mahal in Lucknow in Awadh. Why don't people remember her enough? Though you do come across the name Hazrat Mahal often enough in Lucknow. I think, uh, you know, Professor Mukherjee himself has answered this question in his book in the last chapter, which is also the longest chapter, Afterlife. And he has discussed the question of you know, the writings on, on uh, Lakshmi by the first, the earliest to which apparently was Rabindranath Tagore. Yes. Of course, there is that huge work of V. Savarkar, Indian, the, the, the first Indian war of independence, in which the, the, what was described by the British as a mutiny was began to be seen as, in fact, a war for independence uh, and a resistance tyranny, which, of course, uh, the professor had brought out so clearly. Uh, but in this case, the, the interesting thing is, of course, yes, the importance of Hazrat Mahalatif is discussed in the book, and there, there are reasons given. Uh, I would recommend that instead of my trying to explain this, there, there are reasons given and very, very cogent and, uh, and, and, and uh, convincing reasons as to why this is the case. Uh, Lakshmi Bai was a warrior in the field. Her whole strategy, her whole, her whole, her whole claim to uh, to the to the to the iconic sort of uh, uh, image which she has built is the fact that she was a martyr to the country. Begum Hazrat Mahal was a person who started life as a survivor, but then rose to become a leader. Now, the interesting thing about this is, and that is in fact the question that I'm going to put to uh, the professor also is. I quote from, from the book, the, embra the embrace but the embrace of a popular uprising, the, the trust upon them leadership roles, made them fulfill the dream and dare one add for women of the future too, of what a woman ought to be and ought to do. So many the point that I would like to hear, mention to you here, and also now put this as a question to the professor, is that this book brings out clearly what a woman, an Indian woman, both were Indian women, of very, as, he, as he mentions, both a very ordinary background. Not the Rani Lakshmi Bai was a Brahmin, but not of a top aristocracy, of a middle level aristocracy. But an unusually for a, a woman that was also trained in the martial arts and was a great horsewoman. But Begum Hazrat Mahal was a Tawai, a professional Tawai, an expert in her field, but nevertheless not trained to be a ruler. And how she takes over the leadership. And both these women trust into the leadership. How did they become leaders? Because they were able to command a following of the public. And, the, and, and, and uh, Professor Mukherjee has mentioned that resistance to tyranny is always a collective act. So this is a position of two women leading a collective act of resistance to tyranny. And he has said in 1857, the resistance of common people made leaders of obscure royals. So my question to Professor Mukherjee here is, these two women, royalty, isolated from the public, would so command the following which the public gave them. Even though you may now say that Begum Hazrat Mahal is not given the credit for what she did, but certainly during her time, her ishtihars, as you mentioned, were followed without question by the people of Lucknow. Yeah, I would like to comment. Uh, first, I would like to clarify, because this is 
could be a misunderstanding uh that savarkar uh in his book actually wrote about begum hazrat khan you know we nowadays paint uh savarkar as some kind of uh, prophet of hindutva and therefore hater of muslims and muslim baiter and so on and so forth that's a later phase in his life but in 1909 when he's writing very deliberately he's saying that this was a war in which the hindus and the muslims fought together against british rule and he says he talks about hazrat mahal is as a in his chapter on lucknow and then he also talks about molavi molavi ahmedullah shah okay but he talking about hazrat mahal he says she was also very brave very courageous a brilliant organizer but quite not in the same rank as lakshmi bai so he is drawing up what i call a hierarchy of heroes okay so let's give her savarkar that credit that he actually recognized hazrat mal's contribution to the revolt of 1857 as indeed did uh, rabindranath tagore in rabindranath tagore did mentioned hazrat mal but didn't discuss hazrat mal in his essay on lakshmi bai in 1878 now the other point that uh, mini you raised is why this i'll come back to the very big question that wajahat is asking but why is this forgetfulness if you like lack of a better word regarding uh, hazrat mal there are no folk stories whereas folk stories abound in uh, regarding rani of chansi moasheta devi in a, in a book actually says that at least in 1956 there were still people in chansi who believe that she is not dead mm-hmm. and and on a on a moonlit night you could actually see her walking on the ramparts of the fort of chansi okay uh, reminiscences of subhash bose not being dead and all that you can draw whatever parallels you want to draw but nothing about like this or about begum hazrat mahal and the very remarkable fact is that when jawala nehru wandered among what he called wandered among the kisans and he recount recollects those days in his autobiography over two chapters he doesn't talk tell us that the peasants there uh in raibareli sultanpur pratapgarh and so on jonpur and so on so for these were stamping grounds for the for begum hazrat mal that's where she drew her support that the peasants of that area spoke about uh hazrat mal at all so this is the question you are asking why this forgetfulness yes. now the only answer i can give you is uh to quote a folk song which i do in the in the book and william crook uh collected these folk songs the the lines the relevant line, lines run like this what kind of bravery did bridges kadar the queen and the queen show her name has remained in the world who will ever show such courage last line is very significant when the queen had fled what fight was possible when the queen had fled what flight was possible so i think flight that the she left the battlefield forced to leave the battlefield whatever she didn't embrace death she embraced obscurity in the forests of the terai in nepal and died in penury in terrible conditions that is probably one of the major contributing factors to her being relegated to oblivion whereas people particularly british officers general saw lakshmi bai fighting and she died fighting on her horse back this gives her image a different kind of a halo which is not there for hazrat mahal because she because she fled you know i i have this sentence which i am rather fond of quoting which i i write death defies flight is an amnesiac 